Now, in this election, it has seen the most, the highest number of triangulars uh, ever in any French election, which means that there were so many candidates moving on to the second round. You would see a lot of the horse trading that was happening behind the scenes so that uh, a lot of candidates would actually pull out of the race to allow at least some chances for, let's say, the left to gain a seat or for the, the centrist uh, ensemble led by Macron would actually gain more grounds and more seats in that regard. So you would see that in France, it's, it's a very realist kind of situation here, is that there's a balance of power to be played here, which Macron, I think, would have to be very integral in managing when it comes to forming a coalition government in, in the future. Hello, Internet. This is Kopitam Council. And as you can see, we are in this beautiful studio, but this is not Cal Podcast, I think. Yeah, definitely. We are at Station Podcast all the way in Puchong. Uh, we decided why not we give it a different change of pace. And uh, if you guys are very happy with this kind of setup, do let us know in the comment section below. We're more than happy to try all kinds of places to give you the best quality podcast that we can, right, Hafiz? So Definitely, definitely. And we are on a mission to try all the podcast uh, station they have in Klang Valley, of course. But uh, before we talk into our topics here, I would like to uh, talk a little bit about Euro because it's coincide with what I'm wearing or what the topic is going to be. Uh, if you are a French support, football supporters and also a far-right supporters, you might not be very, very happy because uh, uh, France national team just got kicked out by Spain last night, if you're in the Malaysia time. And uh, also, your party didn't win the so-called projected uh, landslide win against the uh, far left and centrist uh, Emmanuel Macron. So, Adi, uh, what, what, what is this that we see in, in, in France? Well, I mean, if we're going to look at the, the performance of the Euro football teams, right, I'm hopefully England might be able to score a win against uh, Netherlands. Sorry, I didn't mind that shit. Well, because uh, England just had its uh, election with a landslide Labour victory. So um, when it comes to France, right, it's a very weird situation because they were predicting in the first round of the elections that uh, Marine Le Pen with the national rally projected to have a huge uh, gain for this time around. But then uh, we saw that uh, Emmanuel Macron with the ensemble coalition suddenly bouncing back and then now it's a three-way split already. So what we're seeing is that a very awkward situation that uh, Emmanuel Macron has to balance out because it seems that uh, uh, this was the biggest voter turnout in France in, in decades, about 59%, almost 60% voter turnout. And a lot of it had to do mostly with rejecting the growing far-right sentiments that has been brewing across uh, most of Europe, I would say most of Europe. And it's very interesting to see that how the left was able to play ball with uh, Macron here. Macron, uh, I think he's no stranger to be able to walk across the aisle and then you know, taking the whole center stance kind of allows you that luxury to actually go across the aisle and say that, hey, you know, we don't want really want the far-right parties or any of these uh, national rally guys getting more and more and more. So I think that means that they had to find a way to work together. And I think in the end, the results speak for itself that it might, uh, would you say, uh, in a way, an awkward, uh, awkward situation? situation. It's a very awkward situation. But before we dive into more into details like, like what happened in France, I would like to just maybe... Uh, Malaysians here not familiar with how election works in France is that uh, it has two round system. Uh, of course, it's Republican, unlike us, uh, de uh, monarchy, uh, democratic demo uh, monarchy. And in there, they have to do two rounds and whoever got the, uh, the first round win, and then they will go into what they call a triangular, something like that. Like, uh, please, I uh, might be butchering this French word, but in my French, <laughs> uh, so that's what we see in the first round in uh, I think 30th of June that we see a uh, far right party uh, led by 28 year old which is like unimaginable in Malaysia and that party went very well almost got like 50% of the votes and then projected to win big in the second round because if you already win big in the first round, of course, that trajectory is going to carry yourself into that uh, uh, reality. Now, what we're seeing just yesterday is the opposite. Like now those who are in the far left 
actually won the biggest seat, 184 or something, and then leaving Macron in second place instead of he's supposed to be number one. And then far right Ali is go into the third place. So this is very, very awkward, like you mentioned, because this is happening in the midst of there's a, le a left uh, Labour Party in the uh, UK, which is winning by a huge margin, huge majority. And then in France, we have very unstable now. It used to be stable before the Emmanuel Macron called for a snap election. And then it becomes like this. So in a way, gambling that if you want to say that Macron gamble his, his position or whatever, it doesn't pay out for him very well. It pay very good for uh, maybe, uh, you know, uh, Le Pen and also the from far left. So this dynamic I see because of the European election that they get before, I think a month before this election, they would call people like from the left, hey, far right is getting a momentum, get, getting a very good traction here. We need to go to the polls and say that we oppose to all of this. We oppose to the racist remarks by all the leaders by the um, uh, uh, far right party. And yes, like you said, one of the biggest turnout. I think I think since the last four decades. So it shows that people, radical left and centrist in France, really don't want to see you and will do in their most capable cap capabilities to stop far right from forming government. Yeah, I mean, in a way, because you, you mentioned the triangular, right? Uh, so the triangular is that where the first round is that they decide the, you know, the top two and then they will move to the second round. However, the triangular means that you would have more than two uh, candidates that will be moving to the second round. Now, in this election, it has seen the most, the highest number of triangulars uh, ever in any French election, which means that there were so many candidates moving on to the second round. You would see a lot of the horse trading that was happening behind the scenes so that uh, a lot of candidates would actually pull out of the race to allow at least some chances for, let's say, the left to gain a seat or for the, the centrist uh, ensemble led by Macron would actually gain more grounds and more seats in that regard. So you would see that in France, it's it's a very realist kind of situation here, is that there's a balance of power to be played here, which Macron, I think, would have to be very integral in managing when it comes to forming a coalition government in, in the future, because uh, this is only a legislative election. It's not a presidential election. It's not it's deciding whether or not uh, Marilyn Penn or Emmanuel Macron, Macron is going to be, there, yeah. uh, he's still going to be there, is that he's going to have to select a prime minister now. Now, whether or not it's going to be a cohabitation, which means that they will have to pick a prime minister from the opposition, uh, which is in the uh, the national rally, and then they will have to work together and find that middle ground. That presents a challenge for Emmanuel Macron right now to balance out uh, the desire, the aspirations of people who voted for a national rally, but also at the same time try to appease a lot of the uh, voters that uh, went for the left and went for uh, ensemble centrists. And... I think he was right in saying that uh, there were a lot of protest votes as well. Is that maybe some who uh, were more in the centrist uh, ensemble uh, camp, but uh, had a bit more conservative leanings. They would uh, more or less just vote whoever, just kind of to have a protest vote in a way. And I think that also contributes to the high turnout as well, not just to reject uh, the growing far right sent, uh, sentiments, but also just voice out a protest vote as well uh, against the uh, the current administration. And it's funny because at this time you would see one seat being won by a party that is a Basque nationalist. Yes. So the southern part of France, which is a part of the Basque county, uh, a nationalist party from there actually won. So that's a very huge, huge surprise for, for a lot of people. It's like, um, you know, let's say uh, Malaysia, a Sabah-based party never won before for the first time. So in a way, it's kind of uh, similar for France right now, if you want to make that comparison between Malaysia and France. Um, but how do you see moving forward? I mean, will this be very uh, detrimental to Macron's presidential uh, election because in a way it's kind of reminds me of uh, 2002 when uh, Marine Le Pen, uh, Jean-Marie Le Pen, uh, Marine Le Pen's father uh, challenged uh, Chirac and yeah. even though Chirac did win quite, quite uh, significantly, it was a huge uh, signal to show that okay, that means that there's a right-wing element in France that is gaining ground and we see about uh, 20 years later that is coming true. Yeah, I think this is a vicious circle in politics as well, where in, especially in France, you mentioned what happened in 2002, 
But uh, Macron never really got that much of majority compared to Chirac or whatever. So maybe the dynamics, let's say, even Basque can win uh, one seat in that uh, particular region. So that says like how dynamic French uh, politics is. But uh, moving forward, I think this is going to be a diminishing towards, uh, especially ensemble uh, led by Emmanuel Macron, because I think two cycles election ago, far right only got eight seats, and then they got hundred forty something, and next. Okay, we might be wrong again because trage trajectory could be very, very uh, false, like we uh, uh, saw the other day. But uh, this is something on a steady increment. So we can see far right, Le Pen, they can, because they are not in the government, they don't have to think about how to form a government or not. They just have to focus on themselves internally so that they can do and win big in the presidential election. So... This will be will become a stepping stone for Marine Le Pen to eventually win that one election that she really wants and uh, become uh, uh, France uh, president. And also, interestingly, the development in terms of within Europe, the far right also uh, joining the alliance by Viktor Orban, by the uh, established by the Hungarian uh, prime minister. So this is an alliance where Marine Le Pen can say to the uh, French uh, citizens that, hey, look, we got you domestically and we got you in, in Europe. So what else do you want? We got you in terms of policy in, 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 in domestically and Europe, European-wise, we're going to deal with immigration very well because we, we got the entire Europe to work with us. So all you have to do is let us in and be the president. I think this is going to be the number one uh, manifesto for a uh, far-right party going ahead of presentations two or three years from now. So they have ample time to prepare for this. And on the other hand, Macron have to, at this very moment, think, how could he save his prime minister? looking at the dynamics that we have right now, right? Like, it's, there's no, no clear majority. So how are we going to do this? And this headache will carry on until his next election, trying to please all this uh, far left and his on uh, party members that want something out of this election. So that would be, Adi, that would be the basis on how I think far right uh, party will win big in the next election. I might be wrong again. Yeah. I uh, hopefully definitely I hope for the best that it doesn't really come to that when it comes to a far right party. Uh, I mean you mentioned Viktor Orban in Hungary, right? I mean that's already uh, very right leaning already and we can see the kind of after effects of that. Flag. A huge yeah, huge <laughs> red flag. And you can see also in Poland the same similar situation. So I think in a way um in Europe you saw a labor victory, a landslide labor victory and you saw a shaky uh, a centrist legislative victory for, you know, you can call it a victory, might be a Pyrrhic victory in France. So in, in terms of Europe, it's a very dynamic situation going on. And, you know, uh, this year has been seeing a lot of uh, elections happening uh, here and there. And one's definitely going to affect the other. And this kind of signals a lot to the European community on which direction the wind is blowing when it comes to handling uh, European issues here. Immigration, you mentioned, is definitely one. And I think definitely was the uh, platform that uh, Le Pen and a lot of the right-wing parties in Europe are going to be gunning for. Uh, definitely Hungary was uh, successful in uh, championing for that. Um, but, you know, we've already, this is France here, right? I mean, uh, and Europe. What about other parts of the world? Yeah, we already mentioned Hungary, which is Eastern Europe. We might push a little bit towards uh, the Middle East because uh, also another recent election, uh, president, this one is presidential election, happened in Iran. So, Adi, who came up as the winner? So um, Masoud uh, Pazeshkian, if I'm pronouncing that word correctly, <laughs> it, it, Iranian names are very complicated to me, <laughs> sadly. Uh, but it's a it's a very surprising victory because uh, Pazeshkian here is a reformist. He does not come from the clerical uh, party or the clerical institutes. He does not come from uh, the hardliners, which uh, we've seen uh, when it comes to previous president, the late Ibrahim Raisi, who died in a helicopter accident, which we, we covered uh, a few months back. Uh, and we were, you know, we were mulling a lot of different names here, but we never ex expected that the former minister, the former minister of health, I believe, yes. uh, would actually join, come up to become the 
uh, the next president. So it's very surprising. One is because uh, we have never seen a clerical uh, from you know a president that doesn't come from a clerical uh, background since uh, Ahmadinejad, yes. and I think he's the second ever president to to take that uh, accolade. Uh, as, as secondly, as well, is that usually when it comes to the presidential uh, candidates, right? Uh, a lot of them tends to be hardliners, favorite favorite uh, to, to be hardliners by the Guardian Council. So the Guardian in, in Iran it works like this: like the Guardian Council vets who will be the presidential uh, candidates, and usually they would favor a lot of hardliners. Sometimes they would give the token reformists, uh, but then the reformist comes up in the end you to become it? the winner. Yes. So w- what do you make of this uh, situation? We never expected uh, this person. We we threw on around maybe Ahmadinejad come back or maybe Mochtaba or Rouhani, but. This was we never expected. I think I think two factor here uh, weighing in like why uh, Masood uh, win the election. I think firstly because uh, out of six, there's only one reformist, but most of them, like I think five of them, are the hardliners. So in terms of mathematics here, the vote splits between the hardliners. So you can't really see. You can, there's no focus in terms of who get most votes, but. Masood being the only, he's not a radical reformist. He never says change like, hey, we need to be uh, change this to something big. The only big changes they would say is like, let's not men, uh, make it mandatory for the women of Iran to wear hijab. That's it. I think this is yeah. also, you know, why? Because of the recent uh, Amani case that uh, she uh, passed away, got murdered uh, because of this uh, incident. And we see that Almost all votes for this change focus on him. So he is on advantage on that point. Secondly, he is also endorsed by some of the previous leaders uh, because uh, uh, Rohani also, he uh, endorsed him and a few other uh, high uh, uh, political leader. So they actually want this guy to be at helm and uh, turned out they did. Yeah, I mean, um, I think... It's good to point that he is not exactly a radical uh, reformist. He's not the same level as Katami back then, yeah, exactly. who wanted to very much democratize, wanted to very much w- interact with the West. You know, the whole uh, mingling of civilizations that was definitely unpopular for a lot of the uh, clerical and the higher level uh, individuals here. Uh, but when it comes to uh, the reforms here, I think he will have to toe the line here. Uh, Pazeshian, you know, we talked before uh, that Ibrahim Raisi's uh, efficacy as president is only so much as how the supreme leader, the Ayatollah, uh, is able to give them leeway, how much latitude they give the president. And I think this will be no different here. Uh, but like you say, it's not something that is hard to digest. The only thing is, like you said, okay, they want to try to resolve the police brutality case of Masa Amini with the whole mandatory hijab. But at the same time, I think it would be very interesting moving forward. And I think we would see something just as interesting during, during Ahmadinejad's time is the discussion on the nuclear proliferation with the US here. And uh, this is one of the other platforms that uh, Pazhashkian did try to run on, is that he would like to find a way to uplift the sanctions imposed on Iran by the United States. How he's going to do that is that he would have still have to go for the supreme leader and it would have to be uh, uh, capable to the appetites of uh, Washington, uh, which right now I think is becoming a bit... Um, you know, addled in the mind with its current leadership. Uh, so it makes it very interesting to see what happens if we see a comeback of uh, President, uh, former President Donald Trump. Would he double down on Iran with uh, this president or would he actually find this president to be more amicable compared to, uh, let's say, Ibrahim Raisi or the other hawkish uh, presidents like Ahmadinejad at the time? So it's very interesting how it would play out uh, and how much leeway uh, this incoming president will be. But another interesting thing to note also is that uh, the usually Iran's voter turnouts are quite high uh, traditionally, uh, even though it may not be a fully democratic country. But this is the lowest it's ever seen. We talk about France being the highest. Yeah. Now we're talking about this the lowest Iran has seen for a very long time. And a lot of it has to do with, I think, protest votes. A lot of the Iranian people, that they want to have a protest vote by just spoiling their vote, by not turning out. And I think that is a more non-committal way to to gauge, uh, to gauge sentiment on whether or not they are happy with the current uh, clerical and theocratic administration, which definitely uh, has been buckling for some time. A lot of people would like uh, reforms on a more hardline stance that Katami was uh, uh, selling at the time, but maybe with a more you know, uh, 
center uh, reform kind of uh, president, maybe it won't be the reform that a lot of Iranians are hoping, are expecting. So maybe with the whole situation, it would be interesting to see what the, Ayat, the Supreme Leader and the Ayatollahs uh, view uh, the situation and whether or not uh, this would be a, easy, another way for Mojtaba, which is the son of the Supreme Leader, to find his way to insert himself to become the successor of the next uh, as the Supreme Leader of Iran. So, I think this is a great opportunity for Masoud to, before we wrap up this question, uh, topic, is to see that Ayatollah is already 85 years old. I think he, if he can seize out for the next five years as the president of Iran, I think there will be a good opportunity for him as a radical to be more a bit, uh, I mean, uh, reformist, sorry, uh, to be a bit more radical because uh, this is the time where uh, transition will be the weakest of this cleric system. Uh, you say Mr. and whatnot. He may be eyeing for that uh, opportunity as well. So there will be a game of thrones in Iran few few years from now because, you know, uh, that old man is getting getting older. Even older than, much older than Biden, uh, which people joke about we not being able to walk in a straight line. So I think that's the situation in Iran. And uh, I think that's it for the uh, topic about France and uh, Iran for this episode. Uh, any yeah. last word? Adi? I mean, it's interesting to point, just like to point out that to a lot of people, law of politics is not set in stone. Sometimes it tilts to the left, sometimes it tilts to the right, sometimes it balances out on the center. Uh, France, we can definitely see a slow tilt to the right. Uh, Iran, it's hard to say. It's definitely been on the right side of things. But at the same time, it's quite democratic as well. Mm -hmm. So that's an enigma to solve. But uh, we will keep up to date with the happenings in Iran and France uh, in upcoming episodes. So stay tuned for that. Yes. And next up, we're still going to talk about elections, but domestically, right? Yeah. So stay tuned.